as we have some guest speakers that have been patiently here with us all afternoon and cannot be here tomorrow. So with that, let's go to item number 20. And I think we lost Megan to go to class, right? Okay, so Anya, you're up. Good afternoon, commissioners. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, tab 20 is an informational item. Um, in. Sorry. Tab 20 is an informational item. Uh, Bruce Saito, director of the California Conservation Corps, is here today to provide an overview of the Corps and their role in the active transportation program. Senate Bill 1 directs $100 million annually from the Road Maintenance and Rehabilitation Account to the Active Transportation Program. Of the $100 million, $4 million is directed to the California Conservation Corps for active transportation projects. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bruce. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Inman and Commissioners. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak to you this afternoon. My name is Bruce Saito. I'm the director of the California Conservation Corps, and I'm here today with our uh, ATP analyst, um, Nelson, um, and our conservationist one from our Reading Center, uh, um, Nina Thomas and uh, Savannah Brown, that you'll be, be hearing from in a second. So in the beginning, in 1976, then first time Governor Jerry Brown created the California Conservation Corps. And the motto or mission was back then is still the same today, to create job opportunities, um, work experience, and service opportunities for young men and women, mostly 18 to 25 years old, as they in turn provide environmental and community services all throughout the state of California. Currently, the California Conservation Corps has about 1,500 core members working throughout the state at 24 different sites, all the way down to, from uh, National City in San Diego, all the way up to Wairica and Redding. Um, about in the early 1980s, uh, then uh, California Senator um, John Garamendi said, you know, the California Conservation Corps is a great organization, but we need more conservation corps in urban areas. Um, so he really pushed for and passed legislation to create local conservation corps that were not funded by the state, but local nonprofit conservation corps that basically had the same mission of the CCC, again, to provide job training work experiences for young folks, mostly 18 to 25 year olds, but in this case, more in urban areas. The CCC um, and the uh, Certified Conservation Corps can do these kinds of things and these kinds of projects um, using active transportation funds um, and we're happy to, I'm most happy about the last bullet point that says um, in our 1718, 18, it's actually 1718, 1819 allocation, when they're completed, 34 projects throughout California comprising or made up of over 200,000 core member labor hours will be completed by that first two rounds of funding, of ATP funding. And what's not up there, I'm also extremely pleased that of those projects, more than 65% or in disadvantaged communities. The, um, we were asked, you know, so what's the connection? And I, I wish um, I was remiss that uh, Senator Bell left, but I ditto exactly what he said when he was talking about job training programs. And I think he would have said the same thing after our presentation, that we are providing these um, opportunities for young folks to train in these areas, particularly in the transit areas, and use those ATP funds to do exactly that. So these are a list of the kinds of either training programs that we have developed and or the uh, certification programs like Youth Build. The California Conservation Corps does not run a Department of Labor, United States Department of Labor Youth Build program, but many of the local conservation corps do. And so when that says Youth Build and Work Readiness Certificate, that includes the MC3 uh, multi-core uh, collaboration um, funding or training that uh, many of the local conservation corps participate in. Um, so um, I'm going to just touch on one example of a local conservation corps project, and then S Savannah's going to tell you the great things that the CCC has done. Um, 
the council in council district four, 15 in city of Los Angeles there are 15 council districts as some of the commissioners know and so um, the local LA Conservation Corps has worked diligently in partnership with um, LA Metro to um, dig up rebuild um, deconstruct and then construct sidewalks um, in uh, the most uh, 10 of the most important kind of uh, first and last mile touch points along uh, heavy active trans or uh, heavy transportation corridors and in the end they will replace over 2,000 linear feet of damaged sidewalks um, and we believe that this is a perfect example of how conservation corps are working with uh, local municipalities and government to uh, fix these kinds of problems and at the same time provide valuable job training and work experiences for the young folks that participate in these kinds of projects. That's an example of a local nonprofit conservation corps work project and to talk, talk to you about a typical um, California conservation corps project I'd like Savannah Brown to talk to us. Hi. I'd just like, like to start by saying thank you for giving me this opportunity to kind of have a platform to talk about what we do here at the Reading Center. Um, the project my crew is working to complete over the course of the next two years is the creation of an ADA accessible trail and bike path connecting the Sundial Bridge to downtown Reading. Specifically, we've dis decommissioned an old parking lot by the Sacramento River, removed the asphalt, and built a trail with a much narrower footprint made of eco-friendly and porous material. The newly constructed trails connect to a small boat ramp that provides river access for kayakers and canoers. Along with the trail, we have created bioswales and drainage systems to help catch pollutants before they reach the river. We're in the midst of planting various native trees, including valley oaks and willows, which will create habitats for native animal species, aid in erosion control, and provide an aesthetically pleasing experience for trail users. Once completed, this trail will connect to the main Sacramento River Trail System of Reading, which is a huge network of trails used by thousands of Reading residents. Not only will the project create more accessible transportation routes for Reading's disadvantaged communities, but also it will promote stewardship, pride, and ownership for my fellow Corps members. To implement this project, we work with many different partners, including the City of Reading Road Crew and the Turtle Bay Exploratorium employees, some of whom are former Corps members. Through working with these people, I've learned a lot about different career routes offered by the transportation industry. I myself am a second chancer in the CCC. The first time around in the program, I didn't take it seriously, and leaving was one of my biggest regrets. So I went back, and I very quickly realized what you put into the program is exactly what you get out. This time around, I'm working hard and putting in my time, and in the four and a half months I've been back, I'm already on track to promote to crew leader in the next month. I first learned about the CCC when I was still in high school, and I didn't have any direction or structure on where I was heading in life. The CCC has shown me many different career paths and has provided me with the tools I need to be successful. I personally want to become a recruiter for the CCC to get the youth of California interested in preserving and beautifying our state and community, and this time in the seas has given me the work experience and the opportunity to make that career a reality. The opportunities provided by the CCC include the opportunity to work on this project mean a lot to me, but not just to me, also to my family. I have a four-month-old four son at home, and when he's older and can understand, I can take him to the trails that we've built, show him the work that his mom and his crew did. He can enjoy the trails we built, the plants we planted, and the areas that we took measures to preserve. I am proud to be a part of something that will serve our community for years to come. Thank you. Commissioner Gardino. Thank you. I'd just like to say what a wonderful example you are of the, of the CCC. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. You didn't tell us your name. Oh, my name's Savannah Brown. Great. And you're from where? The Reading Center. You are from the Reading area. Uh -huh. The Shasta Th Cascade Crew 25. Thanks for being such a great representative of the program. Of course. Thank you, guys. And I would just add, dream big dreams and the vision of possibilities. I hope that this program has offered you some appetite for what might be, but in our whole transportation sector, it's vast, and the opportunities are really endless. So whatever we can do to share with you, we heard yesterday at our uh, project delivery meeting about some of the outreach work that's going on in terms of really having people 
be exposed to the crazy careers uh, that we all can have and wonderful crazy careers. So I would just want to encourage you uh, to really dream big dreams and go for it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Does anybody else have any questions? No questions, but we, we wanted to applaud you after you spoke, and then Carl spoke too soon. So I want to <laughs> applaud you now. So thank, thank you. you, Shannon. <laughs> thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Well, Have a good night. I just want to say to Commissioner Dunn, who knows much more about show business and stages than I ever will, I'm sorry for stepping on the applause line. <laughs> It's all good. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to item 25. I see 26 is hovering over there. So you want to go 26 and then back to 25? Okay, we'll go to 26. Commissioners, uh, Thank tab you. 26 is an informational item. Eric Sauer, Vice President of Government Relations for the American Trucking Association, is here to provide an overview of the Caltrans and Trucking Association's Pusher Truck Partnership Program, which is an excellent example of public-private collaboration that is helping to promote the efficient movement of goods and improve safety of the traveling public on the state highway system. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric. Are you oh, sorry. Good evening, Chair uh, Inman, Commissioners, uh, Secretary Annis, and Director Berman. I would, I guess Jim and Jim left, so I did say hi to them earlier. Uh, thank you for having me uh, come tonight and speak a little bit about the pusher truck program. I'm actually here to solve the riddle of what is a pusher truck. I think the uh, first slide kind of speaks, uh, speaks a little bit about the partnership between our membership, Caltrans and California Highway Patrol. And I think I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. Um, start with the facts about the program. So everybody likes facts. On average, more than 3,500 commercial trucks uh, travel over the Donner Pass. And during the peak winter season, uh, the number is even higher. They're moving a lot of uh, goods and products during the holiday season. Uh, another interesting note is the amount of money that is traveling on those trucks and uh, according to some statistics over uh, 4.7 million dollars in goods and commerce are tra uh, transported on that corridor every hour. Jeez. And when those trucks are delayed on Donner Pass due to uh, weather conditions or other uh, related issues between five and seven million dollars is lost every hour in productivity and, and the loss of those uh, goods moving. So with that being said, about 30 years ago, one of our members, uh, Consolidated Freightways, who is no, they were a, a large LTL company that is no longer in business, but they were having quite a few trucks that were being stranded on the pass. And so they uh, developed and uh, put together and fabricated a truck and created this truck called a pusher truck. And it was a cab over truck that was specially modified with a bumper on the front and a, count and a uh, pretty sizable weight concrete block on the rear end of the truck to give it kind of a, a counterbalance to push their stranded trucks up over the pass if they get stranded or if they're losing traction. So the, tr the truck, uh, pusher truck program has evolved over time. Back in the day, um, we had before uh, deregulation, uh, our members would volunteer drivers or drivers would volunteer and they'd sleep up in the Kingvale dorms up there and they would hop into those trucks and push stranded trucks. And so post deregulation and the driver shortage issue, it didn't seem too attractive for drivers to spend their weekends or during the week during storms to stay the night in those dorms. So we we actually had to scrap the program. I wanted to also note that this, this service is free for stranded truckers. So if you're stuck, a truck will come up behind you, push you, and free a charge. And once you get traction, once you get going, you move on your way. So through this unique partnership with Caltrans, CTA provides two pusher trucks. And the arrangement on, this, on the pusher truck program is we cover the cost of the maintenance. We lease the trucks to Caltrans. We've covered the service for the, for the trucks, and Caltrans covers the cost of the fuel and, and the insurance under the lease program when we're operating under the lease. They do the pre and post op inspections. 
and they provide the drivers. And so that was why one of the reasons why we parked the program for a while was because there was a liability issue with, okay, who's going to be in control of these drivers or liable for these drivers if there's something that happens. And so through Caltrans and CTA, we met a few years back and we and made this arrangement. So it's a year-round lease where Caltrans leases the trucks from us for a whole whopping $2. So it's a buck a truck um, every year. Um, we've, been, we've been able to have some, of in, including, um, or part of the program is every year or every other year, we usually will get together with Caltrans and CHP and put together these safe, uh, safe winter driving uh, press conferences. And it's a way for us to show off the pusher truck. And these are kind of the, this is some of the information that we pass out and distribute it through the media outlets. And uh, actually, um, the last media event, we had a handful of press there, uh, a couple of the local media market or um, uh, news stations and some newspapers were there. But two years ago, I think we had like 26 uh, media representatives. It must have been a slow day or something because we had a lot of people attending it. So here's, some, here's a picture of the new truck. Uh, I'd be remiss to not acknowledge FedEx uh, and our members' um, um, in involvement in the program. Uh, FedEx, um, it seems like every three years they ask if we need new trucks. And so FedEx will donate newer trucks that are CARB compliant. They're good until 2023. Um, and so this year they provided two newer trucks um, and we had a kind of a ribbon cutting up at uh, the Kingvale facility with Caltrans and CHP and some of our members up there. And this, op this program solely operates through donations from our members. Um, and it's probably one of the easiest things that I've ever been able to raise money for. I throw a notification out there and literally it's the, the we get uh, quite a few members that want to uh, contribute to this program. We even have members that are based down in Southern California that never send trucks over the past that contribute a couple thousand dollars a year to it. Here's uh, one of the trucks in action. So it literally will come up behind a, a truck that's lost traction, placed behind them, they switch over to the CB, the two-way CB radio, and once they start getting moving in traction, um, they release and they back off and the truck goes on its merry way. Here's another uh, up close. And these are clips from the American Trucker Show that was on the Speed Channel, they actually did a feature episode on the pusher truck. So um, the host of the program stayed up around, I think he was up in Truckee, and he waited for a storm to come in because he had heard about this program, which is, by the way, uh, one of a kind program. There is no other pusher truck program in the nation. Um, and so these are clips from it. And if you want, I can send the actual show to Laura and she can send it out to the commissioner. It's a really interesting um, show. It also highlights the, you know, what the Caltrans personnel has to deal with during the winter, um, winter months. And so it's, uh, it highlights the pusher truck program, but also shows uh, Caltrans uh, doing a really good job on keeping, the, on keeping the roads moving. I think that's my presentation, but I also, before I get done, I want to really thank uh, Caltrans District 3 for their efforts, not only with the pusher truck program, but they do a really good job on communicating to the industry, on updating. We, we put together kind of a crude distribution list of if you operate over the summit during the winter months, there's uh, this email distribution list that's run out of the Kingvale uh, operations um, division. And they uh, send out updates, alerts to our members. And then we have uh, yearly recap meetings up in Kingvale and kind of go over what went well, what needs improvement. A good example of uh, Caltrans communicating with the industry was a set of doubles. I'm sure Fran probably knows what I'm talking about, but the 28-foot <laughs> uh, trailer, double, set of doubles, uh, one company kept loading styrofoam in the rear trailer, which would not provide it uh, much traction. And so Caltrans at this meeting, you know, advised these people, hey, you may want to uh, revisit your loading practices. And so um, the company actually switched that, and there hasn't been any problems from that company. And that's my presentation, and thanks for having me uh, come and talk a little bit about the pusher truck program. Great. Do we have any questions? Hey, what's not to love about the pusher truck? And I think the Midwest is probably ringing your line today. Yeah. Well, Eric. Fran, there was a rumor going around that we were going to try and get you on a ride along. <laughs> I would, I'm there. So let I me know there. and I can arrange that. How much does it cost? How much does it cost and how much it's, I mean, it's a public private partnership with 
big capital letters, I think. Yeah, so we literally p provide the equipment, the trucks, maintain them. Uh, we lease the trucks to Caltrans for a buck a year. Caltrans handles the, um, the drivers and the fueling, and we take care of the rest. And do you have an estimate of how many trucks you push in a year? Uh, usually, they'll, they'll, uh, there's quite a bit. And during the storm, those things are literally moving up and down that corridor uh, from Whitmore up to uh, a little bit past Kingvale. I feel a town hall <laughs> coming for us up there. So, yeah, it's great. Yes, Commissioner Dunn. Just uh, as Lori's um, pseudo public information officer, this would be a great story for Caltrans. And uh, so just hint, hint. I think these are things that the public needs to know, these public-private partnerships that are so successful and such a good savings of taxpayer dollars when CTA has done a phenomenal job. Appreciate uh, that. Thank so you. So thank you. Thank you. Here, here. So every day is a freight day, right? Yep, of course. Good seeing you, friend. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for patience with our long meeting today. So, okay, with that, we're going to go back now in my crazy scheduling to item number 25, because I think I have a speaker on this that can't be here tomorrow. So if we can queue up 25, please. Laura? Commissioner's tab 25 is an action item. It pertains to the State Water Resources Control Board's current proposed regulations for the state wetland definition and the discharge of dredged or fill material to waters of the state. These regulations have been under development since 2007 and they are nearing completion. The regulations were originally scheduled to be adopted by the Water Board on February 5th. However, in light of stakeholder concerns that were expressed at the workshops held in the month of January, Water Board staff has been directed to continue working with stakeholders to address these concerns, and now adoption has been deferred until March. Staff has prepared a draft comment letter that's been included in attachment A of your book item. Our comments reiterate concerns that we have expressed in the past that these regulations as proposed have potential impacts to the cost and delivery of transportation projects. And as such, we do want to recommend that the Water Board continue to work with Caltrans and regional transportation agencies to fully analyze the potential permitting and schedule implications of these regulations prior to their adoption. Jeremy Ketchum, who is Caltrans Acting Division Chief for Environmental Analysis, will provide a brief update on the process to date, as well as Caltrans' perspective on complying with these new regulations. And additionally, Karen Mogus with the State Water Resources Control Board will be here to provide an update on Water Board's process as well and answer any questions that you might have. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeremy and Karen. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having us. So as uh, was stated, I'm Jeremy Ketchum. I'm the Acting Division Chief for Environmental for Caltrans. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, waters are wetted areas. They may be streams, rivers, um, and then wetlands would have uh, soils, uh, water feature, and also um, vegetation that has um, uh, water um, type uh, vegetation, hydric vegetation. So. Um, and our type of projects that would impact these areas may include culverts, they may be bridges, they may be widening projects that um, have water features adjacent to them and then uh, if the widening goes into those areas, we may be impacting those. So uh, there are a couple uh, laws that uh, provide the um, jurisdiction for the Water Board to act here. There's the Clean Water Act, which is a federal law, and then there's the Port of Cologne Act, which is state law. And before 2001, essentially, the jurisdiction was the same for federal and state. But then in 2001, 2006, in this time period, there were some US Supreme Court um, decisions that limited the federal jurisdiction. And it wasn't necessarily based on um, environmental issues. It was based on interstate commerce and um, navigability of, of waterways. So that limited the uh, federal jurisdiction, but the state jurisdiction still remained. So the state jurisdiction is still um, prevailing. So there's some areas like in the desert or Lake County, and it could be anywhere in the state, but areas like that where they're enclosed basins, um, they're still waters, but they, they maybe don't drain out to the ocean and they don't have uh, interstate commerce uh, nexus. So they um, are considered gap wetlands or isolated waters 
and they're no longer um, uh, have jurisdiction on the federal side, but they still have um, applicability on the state side. And so water board still needs to regulate those areas. So that's a little chart you see there is a little um, difference there in the regulation and areas that are covered by state and federal requirements. And this one. Okay. So um, in 2007, the state water board tried to um, close this gap by starting to look at procedures to bring about some form of consistency in the application because of this gap that was created. So the um, each of the regional boards were implementing this and they were issuing what are called water discharge requirements um, when there was uh, a need to uh, provide a permit on the state side um, where there was no longer any federal uh, jurisdiction. So the impetus of this is to try to bring about some form of consistency across the state among all the different regional water quality control boards. And this has been an uh, effort that's been going on essentially since 2007. Caltrans has worked proactively with the state uh, board throughout that time to provide comments at opportune times. Um, and the most recent iteration of this is in 2017. Um, and that's the version that has now come uh, before us all now uh, here in 2019 as a proposed uh, final version. Um, so with that, we are, um, have a few items that we've um, brought up as concerns going through the, the process. And the State Water Board, to their credit, has worked uh, proactively with us to try to address some of these concerns. So one of the biggest one was the alternatives analysis. Uh, with uh, federal uh, alternatives analysis under the Clean Water Act with the Army Corps of Engineers, it generally only applies to a small subset of our projects. The initial uh, procedures uh, may have been interpreted in a way that most of our projects would have to go through this alternatives analysis, which was of concern to us. So uh, based on those concerns, and I'm sure from many other uh, stakeholders, the Water Board has added additional exclusions and more certainty into the process to um, take away some of that uncertainty on when an alternatives analysis is required. Uh, another area of concern was uh, projects that have already gone through the process and they may be close to uh, obtaining a permit but they have not applied for the permit yet. Those projects, we were concerned that they've maybe already made a lot of commitments of resources and we would rather that they don't have to rescope their effort. Um, so we would like to see some sort of grandfathering uh, provision in the uh, in the procedure and the water board also uh, made some provisions for that um, so once the office of administrative law takes their action there's another six months the applications can come in before the uh, procedures will be effective and then a third area that's been addressed um, uncertainty over uh, means of financial security so this one um, for us at the state level had to do with the constitutional limitations on being able to provide um, funds and um, so they've added some language that indicates that whoever is trying to get a financial um, assurance cannot do so uh, is not required to do so if it's illegal to, to provide such um, financial assurance so that that addressed our concern there as well so there are some remaining concerns out there um, and we the the agreement or the um, the procedures do provide for the opportunity for certain entities such as Caltrans to enter into a prospective agreement and provide that additional clarification. So we are looking forward and appreciate the opportunity that the Water Board has given us um, to enter into such an agreement. Um, and there's also, with any new procedure and also with some of the um, reports that are required through this procedure, there is some additional requirements for additional reporting. Those likely will result in some additional staff time and also time to train and bring staff up to um, knowledge on these new procedures. Again, the prospective agreement may help us um, limit the additional resources that we'll need to um, put toward this. And then another effort that we have going that we talked about yesterday was 1282, the task force. And that also will give us some opportunities to collaborate with the State Water Board to provide 
uh, efficiencies. So um, there are some opportunities to uh, ameliorate some of these concerns that we have. So where we're at now is um, they did release the uh, procedures on January 3rd and uh, they did have those workshops on January 9th and the 22nd. Um, they did delay the uh, adoption, which was tentatively set um, previously at February 5th. Uh, I have put on the slide here as March 2019. I believe the exact date is March 5th is now the um, proposed adoption date for the procedures. And I believe they've scheduled two workshops, additional workshops in February, and, and Karen can speak to that as, as well. Um, so the schedule from there on out would be then it, after the board takes their action, then it'll go through an Office of Administrative Law. That may be several months until they take action in fall of this year um, if everything continues to go per schedule. And then it may be effective um, sometime in early 2020. So that's the extent of my presentation, and we're here for any questions. Yes, Commissioner Gometti. I'm just trying to get this straight in my mind. Maybe this is a two-part question, but you're trying to make all the regional uh, agencies consistent so that they're each going after the same definition. Is that correct? Yes, and it's the State Water Board that's um, proposing the procedure, but yes. So all um, the regional boards are going to have to follow what the, the statewide definitions are? That is the intent, yes, okay. is to have consistency and, across the state. And has anyone seen the definitions? I, I, are they available to look at? or They would be in the procedure, yes. So they're out now, and has our staff had a chance to review them? So staff has taken a cursory look at the draft procedures. Um, however, as we are not technical experts in this area, we have deferred largely to Caltrans and our regional partners to advise us if they have concerns in those areas. We can certainly share a copy of the draft guidelines. Yeah, I'd or the like draft to see procedures. what the definitions look like. We can do that. Thank you. We, we do have a representative from the Water Board, I believe. So maybe you would like to come forward and share a little bit, and then we'll have more questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to come and answer questions and discuss our process. My name is Karen Mogus. I am the Deputy Director of the Division of Water Quality at the State Water Board, and I, my staff are in charge of the, the, the advancement of these, what I won't call new regulations. Uh, they're essentially documenting our process for water quality certifications and regulating waters of the state, particularly wetlands, for many years. But we have not documented those procedures in a regulation before now. I do want to make a couple of uh, clarifying comments before I move to answer your question about definition. Um, Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act is what um, uh, regulates water quality and water rights in uh, the state and it has always had a broader definition of waters of the state than the clean the federal clean water act uh, Jeremy mentioned that in 2001 the the definitions were essentially the same um, and that's not the case the state waters of the state have always been more broadly defined than waters of the US um, and the change has been recently that the waters of the U.S. have either expanded or contracted depending on the federal administration. Um, so it's not that we're attempting to fill a gap necessarily because we have had jurisdiction over all waters of the state all along since Porter Cologne was adopted back in 1968 or so. Um, so just wanted to provide that clarification. Um, the other clarification, again, is that we are simply documenting procedures that we have already been implementing on a statewide basis and to assert consistency across the nine regional boards. So it provides for a definition of what is a water of the state with respect to wetlands only. It does not uh, define other waters of the state like riparian areas and streams and lakes. It's only fo the definition is only focused on wetlands. Um, in future phases, we hope to define other waters of the state as well. It provides for application procedures that define what a complete application needs to include, and it includes uh, the review procedures that the state and regional boards will use to um, 
evaluate those applications. We have also incorporated into the regulation the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers guidelines for um, <coughs> permitting projects for waters, uh, dredge and fill activities in waters of the U.S. as part of the regulation. So we have, to the degree possible, aligned completely with the Federal Army Corps of Engineers processes. So, with that, we do have a definition of what is a wetland. It is somewhat uh, uh, modified from the federal definition because we do live in the arid west. So it is a what we call a modified three-pronged definition of a wetland. It has to have water. It has to have uh, wetland and uh, hydric soils, basically, and either hydrophilic plants or no vegetation at all. That's the difference, is that in California, there are many wetlands that, like clay pans, for example, that do not have vegetation at all, but are still a water of the state. So, um, and happy to provide you with the, the actual definition um, that we have in the procedures. Um, I also want to clarify that the public comment period has closed. We are not accepting written comments, so any comments that you submit to us will not be part of the record and will not be um, provided to the, the board members as part of the record. Um, we're accepting verbal comments during the board meetings, but not formal written comments at this stage. So just wanted to be clear on that. So our letter <coughs> has it. There's no point in sending a letter then. We have to send a representative to the board meeting? That's correct. Why is, it that Why is it that way? Because we're at a stage now where we're at the final draft. The public hearing has closed and we're essentially responding. The current draft is a response to the comments we received on the 2017 version of the um, procedures. So we're at the stage in the public process where we aren't accepting additional formal written comments. Do we have Question. any questions? Um, we heard, oh, okay, really? Commissioner Dunn. Yeah. yeah, well, there's Just usually an accommodation among state agencies to allow for comments after the fact, so that's what's so interesting that you, you don't see that here. Well, and I'll note that we have, for the last six months, been working really closely with Caltrans staff to go over concerns, work with um, the staff to come up with a memorandum of understanding between the two agencies. We have addressed a number of comments in the interim period to uh, address the concerns of Caltrans, as Jeremy mentioned in his presentation. So we have, um, we have been working closely with state agencies, including both Caltrans, High Speed Rail Authority, Department of Water Resources. So um, yes, we have been working offline with our sister agencies. And then a question for you on the definition. When you give us the three prongs for wetlands, um, the, the, the additional part is that only one of those parameters has to show up in order for it to be a wetland, not all three, correct? That's, that's not correct. That's not correct. All three have to be present. All three have to you be have present. You have to have the water, you have to have the soils. The only difference in arid states, and in fact, Army Corps of Engineers has guidelines for arid states that is consistent with our definition. Um, in arid states, you either have vegetation that is wetland vegetation or no vegetation at all. And clay pans was the example that I give. Playas is another example where it is a wetland according to a water of the state um, under our definition, even though there aren't, there isn't vegetation present. Uh, which explains why a form, in a prior life, a piece of property that I worked on still has a fence around a road rut. Because under that definition, that road rut became a wetland. And that's, I think, one of the struggles that we have is, is there any flexibility in common sense here? Or is it just going to be viewed in the black and white of the parameters you've given? We've provided in the procedures what we are calling a jurisdictional framework mm -hmm. that starts with the definition and then walks through um, the, the, the various ways that you can either be defined as a wetland or you are not defined as a wetland. Um, I don't, we, don't... Is there any subjectivity to this? There is some. 
I'll admit that you know there is some case-by-case -case determinations, but the jurisdictional framework gives a much more defined uh, process for determining whether a water is a water of the state, mm -hmm. a wetland is a water of the state, let Thank me you. just say. Do we have any? Yes, Commissioner. Can I ask a question? Um, if we had written a letter, one of the things we would have been speaking about was um, there's a written agreement provision that apparently you've agreed to with Caltrans, but you're not extending that agreement to local and regional agencies that might do construction. Can you explain to us why you're not doing that? Yes. So we already have a memorandum of understanding with the High Speed Rail Authority for their project um, with the intent that we... Um, Can you speak up? I'm having a hard sorry. time hearing you. We have a, a similar MOU with High Speed Rail Authority that we've been implementing over the last several years. And uh, the idea there is that uh, State agencies like Caltrans have a much broader scale and scope of projects that you're working on. And so the MOU does not give a free pass. It actually uh, clarifies how we're going to work through the procedures for all of the Caltrans projects in terms of timing, in terms of coordination with other agencies. You're not and answering my question, and we're running out of time. Um, so. It would not be, we do not have the resources to have an MOU with every local agency that does transportation. Do you project. understand that a lot of state roads are fixed by local agencies that take a lead in the construction? So on, a, on a, an improvement project, a STIP funds may be used by a local agency to improve, improve a state route? Yes, I understand that. Okay, and why wouldn't the, the same uh, uh, written agreements that are suffice for Caltrans, why wouldn't they be for the local agency who is working on that? Well, I guess my answer to that is that the procedures would apply regardless of whether it's Caltrans project or a local project. And so the requirements are the same. The MOU with the state agencies is intended to do two things. One is both Caltrans and High Speed Rail Authority will be providing resources person years to the state water board and the regional boards to expedite the permit process. So that's one difference. And then the other is that uh, we, and this may be the case for the local projects, but we're asserting that the HSRA and Caltrans projects already go through a pretty extensive alternatives analysis for CEQA, for example, that we would be able to rely on. So it's spelling out how we're going to work together as agencies. But why not? give that, that uh, opportunity for written agreements for the local agency uh, that has a local road that ties into that state highway? I guess I don't know that that would be any more efficient than just issuing them uh, a permit. We still have to go through a process of entering into okay. agreement. So. Well, just to add on to that, we did hear from our regional agency partners today their concern over confusion in their perspective, at least on the definition still, and then the footnote eight, which is the MOU uh, in relationship, because uh, in many of our regions, our local partners are doing a lot of projects. So I think there is more concern. So I guess the question I have, if everything's closed, what are these upcoming workshops? What's the intent? So, yeah, thank you for asking that. We're working with stakeholders who have, who came to our board workshop on the 22nd and had some concerns about clarity of the intent of the procedures. So we're working with stakeholders this week, starting tomorrow. We have five uh, focused stakeholder meetings to go over what staff intended as the procedures and make sure that the language um, is clear to our intent. So these aren't policy level type um, issues we're trying to raise. This is more making sure the language comports with what we had intended. So uh, that's what the, the meetings are this week. Next week on Wednesday, we're holding a broad stakeholder workshop where we go over any changes we identify this week that help clarify. And then the second part of the meeting will be to discuss a policy issue that our board asked us to work with stakeholders on, which was re with respect to the alternatives analysis requirements. 
and we don't anticipate getting consensus in the room, but we will be discussing it and bringing back an update to our board as they requested on February 19th. They have a board meeting um, on that date. And then we intend to release the final language with any change sheets associated with, with the clarifying language by uh, February 22nd, which will be uh, with the board agenda for the March 5th board meeting. And that's where the board will consider adoption. Yes, Secretary Annis. Yeah, thank, thank you, Karen. Um, I was just clarifying a couple things with uh, Jeremy, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe in the case of a, uh, a self-help county that's doing a project on a state highway, uh, there could be an agreement where Caltrans would apply for the permit, and so then that project could be covered over the under the terms of the of the MOU between the Water Board and Caltrans. Did I say that correct? Okay. Yes, correct. <laughs> All right. And then the second issue was uh, uh, Caltrans is planning to attend the Water Board hearing and would be happy to uh, uh, read the CTC letter if that was a permissible. Uh, uh, you know, testimony at the board hearing. Yes, that is permissible. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Dunn. Uh, I would like to make a motion, unless there's any other questions. I, I would like to make a motion. Thank you very much for that, for uh, Caltrans to read the letter. But in addition, I'd like our letter to be sent to every board member of the State Water Resources Control Board directly with a notation that uh, it was not going to be accepted um, post comment period and so we want to send it directly to the board themselves okay so we have a motion and a second do we have more discussion yes commissioner I would uh, like to ask staff would is would it be of any help to uh, add additional language in paragraph three to be a little bit more in depth on this um, on the on on the issues that on specific a little bit more specificity and examples uh, uh, as it relates to what we're specifically asking for. You're referring to the letter right now? I am looking at the letter, the draft letter, and paragraph, I believe it's paragraph three, excuse me, on the second page, page two, top paragraph. Um, I don't know if it would be helpful to add some more specificity to that or not. Um, but it may uh, be a, a little bit more uh, given the fact that I, I think the Water Board does not have an appreciation for how much local governments and local agencies do work and this notion that somehow well, we'll cut deals with Caltrans and, and high speed rail and leave local governments who, who uh, control 80% of the lane miles in California out of the deal is it, I think that needs to be fur further illuminated if, if the, the maker of the motion would be a... I concur. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I do have one public speaker, so before I go totally out of line here, could I call David Lenham from Stanislaus? Sorry, David, I should have called you sooner. Hey, that's all right. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the locals, David Lehman, Stanislaus County Public Works Director, and I'm also the chair of the County Engineers Association of California Flood Control and Water Resources Committee and were concerned to terrified about this. You heard her. They're picking off Caltrans and high-speed rail and they're going to leave the locals to suffer. You also heard that it's person years of effort that Caltrans is going to have to put in here. I'll give you a brief example. Crow's Landing Road Bridge or the San Joaquin River is an LSSRP project that we have Prop 1B money on. This project has been con continuous project development for 18 years, since 2001. We're getting an Army Corps of Engineers permit, a 404 and a 408. A 408 is because we have a, a regulated levy there. We get a permit from the Central Valley Flood Protection Board. We get a permit from the U.S. Coast Guard because we're a navigable, traditionally navigable river. We're getting a permit from California Fish and Wildlife, San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, State Lands, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. I count eight permits. This would be the ninth. And you heard person years there that Caltrans is going to throw at this effort. That means us locals are going to be thrown to the wolves and it's, we're frustrated. It already takes us way too long to develop projects. And the Crow's Landing Road Bridge project is a seismic safety and scour critical bridge over the San Joaquin River. This is a safety project. 
and and we're it just the locals are frustrated, you know. And it's not just Stanislaus County; it's Del Norte to Imperial. We all suffer, and so some of the I'll read the top three. We we are concerned about the clarification of routine maintenance definition and removing alternatives analysis for routine minor maintenance. Um, we do have a, a channel maintenance agreement in Stanislaus County, and we go out and clear some some stuff, and we just don't need alternatives analysis for clearing brush out of a creek so we're not flooding the people of Newman, California. Um, Army Corps of Engineers definitions policies are well understood, and the 404 process is defined and navigable. It, we're concerned about a state versus fed loggerhead. So state water board and the feds, you're not gonna budge either one of them, not Stanislaus County, not San Joaquin County, not Merced, none of us. And so we're gonna be stuck between a rock and a hard place, we're afraid. Um, it, the expansion inconsistency with uh, the federal definition. You know, the way I read it, so it could be the entire valley floor is a wetlands for the love of Pete. That's what I'm afraid of. From Redding to Kern County is now uh, waters of the United States, or the waters of California. You know, it, I, I, where will this thing end? So, and we're super concerned about the lack of the permitting deadlines. At least with fish and game, fish and wildlife, California fish and wildlife, you get the statutory relief and you get a standard permit after 60 days. There is no provision for this here. So, you know, it's to, we would be remiss not to st sit here and tell you what the locals' concerns are, and we would absolutely want a Me Too with Caltrans on this one. We're a political subdivision of the state. I remind people that all the time, all 58 counties. We're you. We're a political subdivision of the state of California. Please, we're, treat us nice. We're nice people, I promise. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any more comments? Okay. I asked the State Transportation Agency, do you have, you know, uh, I, I have a lot of concerns that we have an agency that's kind of gone off and doing their own, own thing and, and not really listening to the, what we're trying to get done here in transportation. Everyone's trying to be a good steward, but we have to work together. And it seems like they've just said, nope, the train's leaving the station and we don't care about the locals. And, and I, as, our, as the transportation secretary, I would just, how do you, do you have any thoughts on that? And is there some, some work to harmonize this? Sure. Well, I, I, I think, one of the issues that we're all working through is, uh, you know, making sure that both priorities are met, that we're able to move forward with transportation projects without uh, delay, certainly unnecessary delay, and that we're also able to protect the waters of the state appropriately. So, um, you know, I, I think this dialogue uh, is, is important and, and, you know, participation at the upcoming water board meeting is important, but I do want to, you know, indicate that we have been working very closely with the water board over not just the last six months, but over the past couple years and many of the uh, items that are incorporated are not just related to the, the MOU that uh, Caltrans can enter, but also more global issues that would affect, you know, all uh, uh, transportation projects, be it state or local. Well, as I said earlier today, collaboration, we like to think is our middle name, so I think this is an opportunity where we need to. So to the extent, it causes me grave concern when I hear from our regional partners that they're worried. They don't understand the definitions. They think it's confusing and the unintended consequences. And then to have the maintenance um, comment brought up, the intent of SB1 was really to state a good repair. So we're in a full court press, in my opinion, to improve our state of repair. So to the extent that this is gonna be confusing, and when people are confused, we we'll all get stuck. So I'm not sure what we can offer up, but Brian, I'm happy to go with you and let's sit around a table and figure out uh, what it is. But I think for sure um, we need to we need to find a way that we can all 
talk to each other and work through these. And uh, I think footnote eight was new with this draft, as that's the MOU in my understanding, if I, if I read that. And I admit that I am not a water expert, so uh, I get a little bit lost with some of those words. But I do think that um, it is confusing. So if our regional partners are concerned, I, I think we all need to figure out a way that we can move together. So. Um, any other comment? Yes, Commissioner Arp. Um, I remember some years ago, uh, we got in the middle of a, uh, Caltrans was uh, under, under application for a major, the statewide construction permit. And, and uh, basically the initial reading of that uh, by the State Water Resources Control Board was um, that you know, any, any body of water that came under any Caltrans facility w was responsible for anything that happened upstream kind of, this is in simple terms, you know, they might uh, dispute it, in, in, but that was the basic. And the cost, the price tag of that at the time was more than what the entire shop program was generating. This was back before uh, SB1, this was when the funding was really tight. And we couldn't get the State Water Resources Control Board to really respond to a basic cost-benefit question. Uh, it didn't seem like that was, we were basically told that's not, that's not their job. And uh, so when I finally brought it to uh, Nancy McFadden, may she rest in peace, and said, look, this is what we're dealing with. Um, uh, we finally got some attention and, uh, you know, I think we, we were able to mitigate that somewhat. But, you know, this is a concern to me is that a lot of, I mean, we're talking about trying to fix bridges that have a safety concern that could collapse. And so we're, we're mired in permits that um, slow the process, increase the cost immensely. And uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the permits, but there's something wrong with the whole system in terms of being able to expedite and recognize that some things need to be moved forward. We gotta figure out a way not um, to have the same process for certain kinds of projects that save people's lives. When we had, uh, some of you will remember, uh, we were at a CTC meeting a few years back down in Riverside and a truck went under a bridge and it was disastrous and they had to fix it. But uh, Caltrans basically had to uh, pony up, it wasn't uh, State Water Resources Control Board in this case, but they had to basically uh, fork over some mitigation in order to fix the bridge. Now, I, that just made no sense to me whatsoever. The project, <laughs> the structure was already there. It got damaged. It needed to get re replaced, refixed, and, uh, and fixed, and yet they had to, to uh, provide a big chunk of money for, to mitigate the project. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to those things other than the fact that I share this engineer's frustration that sometimes, you know, it's awfully hard to get a project done that is going to save people's lives. Okay, more comments. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Hearing no further comments, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. So do we need, Susan, do you need any further direction? Or? Could take the info and consent quickly if there's an item to pull Oh, no. I, I want on this particular item. We good on this item? We have, and Secretary Annis, I'm happy to work with you. So we got a little sidebar going there, but for the record, we want to work with everybody. So thank you all very much. Okay, now, Susan, can we look at this? Because we're going to run out of time with the WTF. Yeah, we're out of we time. We are out of time. Um, the question, though, that I would have of the commission, because we want to make sure we, we cover the resolutions and necessity uh, that are on the consent calendar. Would it be possible, the willing of the commission, to take the consent calendar at this time and move it unless there are any, any questions we pull off the consent? consent it should be. Now? Uh, consent. Yes. Second. Oh, so, well, we, we have to let them present first. <laughs> yeah. There go. might be, yeah. Okay. It'll be, it'll be okay. fast. Staff, take, okay. go to the consent calendar. Everybody, just for clarification, that begins on item 37, if that's correct. That, that's correct, Chair Inman. So, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. There's 14 agenda items, items 37 through 50. 
that are on the consent calendar. Please note that item 40 has been withdrawn from the consent calendar. Um, additionally, um, there are the following changes that are noted. So um, there are 11 withdrawn resolutions of necessity, so you only have 12 instead of 23. Also, on tab 46, it's not noted on your change list, um, but project 01 of the director's deeds was pulled, so we need to read that into the record and make sure that um, that, that is noted. Um, so, addition, um, so with those noted changes, commission staff recommends the commission approve items number 37 through 39 and number 41 to 50 on the consent calendar. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni and a second by. Information. I like that. That was sufficient. Okay, Kehoe, Commissioner Kehoe moved. I didn't hear her back there. And then a second by Commissioner Burke. So they're counting noses. Do we have enough? We need eight. We have eight. We have eight. Okay. We have eight. Okay, then all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining, that motion carries, so, okay. And apologize for the crazy numbering system we did today, but we'll take up with 18 tomorrow. 